just before this thing began, uh, they came up and they said, hey, you've got 45 minutes. And I was like, 45 minutes, oh my god. Because earlier, I didn't realize, you know, when I made my first presentation that we were going to have uh, 30 minutes. So I made like a long presentation, and then I cut it down to size, uh, and they said I could do the whole thing. So I'm going to have to go fast. So the, the presentation begins with Node.js. This is part one. Okay, so what is Node.js? Node.js is a server-side uh, JavaScript server library for building servers. Uh, using evented I.O., which I'll explain in one second. Okay, so here's an example web server written in Node. I'm not sure if you can read it, uh, especially all the way in the back. But basically, you require the HTTP module, uh, or what have you. You call create server on that. You give it an anonymous function in JavaScript, which takes a request and response as arguments. Then you say response right head 200 content type text plain which is the absolute bare minimum for an OK response with some content coming back from a web server. And then you do response end with hello world. And then all you do after that is add on that you want this function and this server to listen on port 8124. Uh, hold on. Scroll down. Put it horizontal. OK. So Shane Becker, who I'm not sure where he is, but he told me that it's cooler when you're doing this if you can actually make it look as if... <laughs> See, lasers come out of my fingers. Right. Any, anyway, so you give it the port to listen to and uh, listen on and the IP address. Okay, so that, that's the basics. Um, is it already time? No, no, I'm okay. just <laughs> Okay, so this, this is a picture of a bad day at, of employment at a coffee shop. Now, you might wonder why on earth I'm showing you this graphic. This is to explain the invented I.O. thing that I mentioned earlier, okay? So, there's this asynchronous evented thing that Node.js does, which is quite bizarre when you first get into it, right? And the coffee shop is actually the best metaphor I've heard for explaining it, right? Uh, Typically, when you're programming with, um, well, okay, just, you go into a coffee shop, you order whatever it is you want to drink. You say, like, I'd like to have a latte, right? They say, okay, we're going to make your latte. And then you wait for a second, and they're like, latte, and you're like, that's me, and you get your latte, right? That's asynchronous uh, organization, right? If they were using a threaded model in coffee shops, it would go like this. You go up there, and you're like, I'd like a latte. They're like, okay. They take your money, they make the latte, and then they give it to you, and then they ask what the next person in line wants, right? Which would be really annoying and would cost them a lot of customers, because everyone would go to the places that uses uh, evented and asynchronous organization. So, if you talk to people about Node, they'll be like, my god, the asynchronous model is so strange. And you'll be like, no, it's easy, it's like the coffee shop. Okay, <laughs> so, Node runs on the V8 interpreter from Google. It is blazingly fast. If I understand the lineage correctly, the strong talk guys whose son hired to make the Java VMs got hired away by Google to create V8. Um, that's if I recall correctly. So long story short, it's fast. It comes from Google, although this is actually cluefulgoogle.gilesb.com. This is a little bit of self-promotion. I have been known to indulge in self-promotion from time to time. Uh, cluefulgoogle.childsb.com over here, it says, imagine how cool it would be if Google was useful for JavaScript documentation. And this website is like a Google that is useful for JavaScript documentation. Hey, OK. Uh, this is a flying camel. Uh, <laughs> so to install it, this, this installing it is really straightforward. You go here, major, local, configure, make, make, install, bada bing, bada boom. It's like anything else on Linux or you know, OS X any type of Unix. Uh, pluses to Node.js. The big thing that is making it popular is that it is fast as hell. It is just ridiculously fast. Uh, here they have some benchmarks for it, serving 10,000 requests per second. Uh, here's a blog post by a guy who actually had Python going faster until he started optimizing and got it you know, pretty fast. Uh, another thing that I think is actually even bigger win is it's mega convenient. 
And one of the reasons it's convenient, here's a, a Jasmine node. Well, I don't know where Evan is, but the, uh, okay. The Jasmine library for uh, JavaScript BDD, or specs, uh, comes from Pivotal, Pivotal Labs. This is a fork, which is uh, altered slightly to run with Node. Um, I don't know what they use, I think maybe Rhino, like out of the box. But what makes it so convenient is this right here. The I represents the number of people who are following it, and the fork represents the number of people who are forking it. So you can see that one out of every three people who follow this project have forked it. This is the same uh, on Node, where um, it's not quite, it's not the same number, but it's still quite high. 4,500 followers, 485 forks. So one out of every 10 people who follow the project forks it. This is how you know that an open source project is doing well, when you have high ratios like that. Um, now, minuses to Node, uh, I haven't actually had any real problems with Node, community-wise, but I've heard gripes that their social skills are, you know, I mean, this is the guy, wait, can, okay, the guy on a bear with a machine gun, with, with a machine gun, <laughs> and if you notice, this is actually a second machine gun, uh, he is there to, um, uh, to represent a, uh, not necessarily the user-friendliest attitude in the world. You might not want to file support tickets with this guy. <laughs> Although, if you look very closely, he has a guitar. So, you know, maybe he has a, a sweet side that we don't know about. Anyway, it's very fast changing, is another downside of Node. Uh, if you write something in Node, three weeks later, you might have to change some, you know, API. Like, util becomes utils. Little things like that. Uh, then there's this, which when I made the presentation, I thought was something serious, but on further reflection, is not. And I'll tell you why, at the very end of this presentation, assuming I get to it, there is a solution for this. Uh, this is a guy saying, he's on the Node.js list, and he's like, I love this asynchronous model, but I just can't code like this. And I'll read it to you real quick. I love the event loop, and I understand the execution model, and I don't want to change it. I don't feel like JavaScript is desperately missing macros. But I need someone to talk me down, because I'm coming to the conclusion that certain parts, uh, certain sorts of programs are unwritable without language extensions. So, again, I thought this was a serious thing when I first encountered it, but if you think about what he just said, he's like, guys, I'm not a heretic, but I'm, I really need someone to talk me through this, because I've come to the conclusion that this tool is only suited to particular types of problems. Okay? So that's some drama queen nonsense. So I apologize for even showing you the slide. But he does raise one thing here which is kind of interesting, which is in a typical synchronous JavaScript thing, you would have something like this dot that dot the other thing. And you can this whole thing here is just chaining, right? It's a very common technique. What he's doing here. This is what you sometimes have to do with a uh, node. Hold on. Basically, everything, in order to support the asynchronousness and the, uh, the event model and so on and so forth, it's all done with callbacks. So when you do that, the callback pattern is typically first error and then whatever data, right? So, I know, but the lasers, they just weren't working. Um, if error, throw error, if error, throw error. He's saying, in order to do chaining, which is so easy in synchronous JavaScript, in asynchronous JavaScript, you've got to throw in these if error, throw error things with every callback. And he said that was driving him nuts. There's a solution a little bit later in here. But in fairness, people have asked themselves, with such a ridiculous error handling model, were the people who created Node.js coding drunk? Uh, this has been controversial to some people, I don't really care. Um, what I really like about Node.js is being able to use JavaScript on the command line in a fast way that does not involve Java. This is one of the first things I did with it, is a blog comment similarity detector free code for Discus, which Discus heartbreakingly scorned. Uh, here it is, this is what it's for. Uh, these are a whole bunch of trackbacks from blog comments on this guy's blog. Uh, so he posted this uh, blog post 
What it says is NLP challenge, find semantically related terms over a large vocabulary, one million plus words, and then the link. And you can't see from this distance, but these are all a bunch of different bit.ly links and you know, t.co links pointing to the same place. And in a few of these retweets, the word find in find semantically blah 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 is capitalized, it has a capital F. And in others, it has a lowercase f. So on this blog post, these are all taken from the blog post about finding the semantically related terms. And what actually happened on this thing, uh, Discus reported every link back to the, the blog post as being a discussion of it on Twitter. So the discussion consisted entirely of retweets with only one exception, which was I posted a link to this blog post and I said, at Discus, please filter highly similar tweets. And if you went to this blog post, it would be listed as part of the discussion on the blog post. So that is a really easy way to fill any Discus using blog with spam, right? All you do is you say, free Viagra, link that you want them to go to for the Viagra, and then link to the blog post. And suddenly you have spam, 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 spam. Completely filled. You could literally pwn every single discus using blog in this manner, in you know a matter of hours. It's trivial. So I wrote this thing, it's a blog comment similarity detector, and I wrote it in Node.js, and I used something called underscore.js, which I don't have time to explain. Uh, but I do have time to show you the page. Giles Boquet, Discuss Blog Comment Similarity Detector on GitHub. I kind of have to rush here. Okay, so what this does is it finds highly similar tweets. It just uses the JSON, filters them, etc. Oh, wow, can you, can, okay. Can you read the red parts of this? Uh, no? Yeah. Okay, this I'm gonna have to go through even quicker. This was some legacy code uh, what I did, it, at the top, it calls a particular method with all these, uh, you know, repeated uh, settings, right? So what I, what I did is I shrank it down to this, and I did that by first creating little spreadsheets of what are the invariant fields in every call, right? Which was uh, basically just an ACK, like, bash script. And then I wrote a little thing here, which is a tiny templating engine. It's impossible to see this, so you're just gonna have to believe me. Uh, <laughs> and then this here, what it does, okay, core.register group was the name of the function, right? Um, I blacked out a lot of the, uh, the details because this is like client code, I can't show you those parts. But this redefines the function as being a function that takes in command line arguments or function arguments and only spits out those arguments which are variant, right? So what it would do is it would have different concepts of which, uh, different objects basically, uh, that had their own built-in defaults, right? And then having defined this function this way, it then evals requiring the file that has the original, uh, you know, bigger, blockier legacy code. So this was a legacy code compressor and what you can see, well, you can't see it, okay, but this was a little spreadsheet that I made where it's a checklist of all the changes, you know, generate the code, check it for the commas being correct, and I took 418 lines of, yeah, okay, I removed 418 lines of code uh, automatically, right? It took me some time to write the thing in uh, JavaScript that did it, and then it just ran through it. And that's stuff that you can't do with client-side JavaScript uh, unless you have something that you can run it in. And you could conceivably have done that in a browser, but it would be painful. Oh, um, I also have a system called Tally, uh, which I created in 2008. Uh, this is like the revision. It uses Node.js actually to find highly similar functions. Although, it also... Uh, also uses Ruby, which I hack at LARB, and it also uses Sibilant JS, which I'll tell you about in a few moments. Uh, and it also does extremely simple wrapper functions. And oh, this is more self-promotion, so I'll, I'll get through it really quick. This is a spec uh, that passes where it's in Ruby and also JavaScript, where it can take some JavaScript 
and write a wrapper function around it automatically. Um, and it can do this other stuff. Now, this is for my own nefarious capitalist purposes, so I won't dwell too much on it. Uh, the other reason I won't dwell too much on it is it is largely vaporware, but it has some cool parts that do work. Uh, and if you want to find out more about it, uh, there's overnightrefactor.gilesb.com, which is nothing but a uh, mailing list capture thing now, but may hopefully evolve into something more interesting. Anywho, another thing this is very useful for is unit testing, right? Um, it is very nice to be able to take those parts of your JavaScript which do not depend on the browser and unit test them separately so you can just ch check them out on the command line without having to care about loading them up in the browser. Um, it makes sense to test stuff against the DOM when it interacts with the DOM, but if you've got any kind of code that just deals with models, um, you know, controllers, a lot of that stuff, it's faster on the command line and a lot more fun. Uh, this is Jasmine, which you would use for that. Um, so here's an example of actually doing that. This is key to uh, how you use require with Node.js. This is its whole packaging system right here. All you do is you add objects to an existing exports object. Uh, and exports might as well be called namespaces because what it does is it provides like a fully object-oriented namespace. Uh, you know, with the caveat that when I say fully object-oriented, I mean fully object-oriented in the JavaScript sense, which is an unusual paradigm of object orientation. But this here creates a maffinator with a function called add, which returns a plus b, right? And this is unfortunately strings are in red in this, but this is a spec for the mathinator. And you can see it does a before each where it sets the number is equal to zero. Then it says expect number equals mathinator add number one to equal one. So you add zero to one, you expect that to equal one, and this spec passes, which, you know, is good. And here's a bunch of other specs passing. Another thing that Node.js is uh, good for, and a little closer to what it was intended for, is mini-apps. Uh, the first thing I built with it is a minimal GitHub dashboard. Uh, again, if you want to see code for this, it's on GitHub, uh, and you can find more information about it on my blog. Here's what it looks like on the iPad. Basically, it takes all of your repos that are not forks of another person's repo and shows them. So up here, minimalgithub.com, uh, I'm sorry, minimalgithub.gilesb.com, GitHub username. In my case, Giles Bouquet. Obviously, there are plenty of other GitHub news usernames that you can put up there. The way it does this, this is the whole thing. It's uh, 22 lines of code. So, and, and actually, one of those lines is unnecessary. This line here, sorry, I just noticed that. Uh, sys equals require sys. That pulls something from the common library for Node.js that I'm not actually using. I was using it for debug. Um, so, again, you start by requiring the HTTP namespace, and you do a create server, right? And then there's REST, you use that to require RESTler, which is a REST library, and then Jade is a templating library. And this whole thing is, uh, you know, it's very brief. Now, going back to this whole evented thing, what you do first is you set it up to uh, do this gets, right? It does get against the GitHub API. It gets all the repos in JSON format for the GitHub username. Then it adds a listener for when it's complete, and it renders the file using Jade, and it adds another error, uh, I'm sorry, another listener for the error event, uh, which I did not bother to write in the handling form. I just didn't care. Um, this is another mini app, uh, it's called Minimal Bitly. So, uh, again, you can find more information about it on my blog, uh, and along with the code on GitHub. Um, this is what the Bitly homepage looked like at the time. Now, what I typically use Bitly for is compressing stuff so I can put it in Twitter, on the Twitter uh, web interface. So, in order to do that, you have to deal with all this distracting bullshit. <laughs> Right? And then you, 
there's this other bullshit over here. And if you look next to it, you'll notice some more bullshit. Uh, then some more bullshit, and then a bullshit fish. <laughs> and just to point out how bullshit this bullshit fish is, they didn't even finish drawing it. <laughs> Because they knew it was bullshit. They was like, it's not gonna look like a fish, it doesn't need to be there, we'll just, you know, it's almost drawn. But anyway, that after you get through all that shit, this here is actually useful. So you put in your link and you click shorten and you think, aha, I'm done. All I have to do now is when the link comes back, I hit that link where it says your link, and I double click, I, you know, I, I copy paste, no big deal. Wrong. Once you get your link, if you try and put your cursor in there, you get some more Ajax bullshit. So I was like, I just can't handle this. This is minimal bitly, okay? You put in your link there, you click go, you're done. Okay. Uh, you might be familiar with this. Typical Apple product, this is a very popular, uh, you know, uh, web comic illustrating the need for simplicity, okay? Uh, this is a book which, you know, don't make me think. I don't know if they read that at the beginning, but they should have, uh, in my obviously uh, you know, somewhat aggressive opinion. And this is what the Bitly homepage looked like about a week and a half after I released the Mill Bitly. Ooh, which is pretty cool, actually, I have to say, because when I tweeted to Discus, hey, I wrote some free code for you that prevents you from making every single one of your users vulnerable to incredible amounts of spam, they didn't do anything. They were just like, uh, we should not acknowledge this peon. <laughs> so I, I, I really think that uh, Bitly deserves a little bit of applause for restoring simplicity. So please, please, a little applause for Bitly. Just a little bit. That, that's excellent. Anywho, you can find the code right here. Giles Boquette, minimal Bitly, it's on GitHub. Uh, again, I just, uh, hold on. Where's the laser? There we go. What? Uh, okay. So, uh, you require HTTP, you require sys even though you don't need to, require utils even though you don't need to. Those two steps you can actually skip. Uh, require node static, that's a little static server. Uh, and then Restler and Jade, which are again the REST and uh, template libraries. So this one's a little longer. Um, I can't go into like line by line detail, and you can't see it anyway. But again, this took you know 20 minutes to write. Uh, it was really, really easy. It kind of takes you back to like the old days of like Perl shell scripts and stuff like that through CGI in like 1996, um, which is not necessarily a great day to go back to. But the simplicity of it is you know quite a lot of fun. Uh, okay, so one more thing: Jade, the templating engine. I mentioned this a couple times. It's basically Haml, but for Node.js, and it has, you know, where you would normally use like a, a Ruby hash, you use a JavaScript hash, stuff like that. Uh, so, long story short, Node.js is pretty awesome. This is a diagram of awesomeness. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that uh, Chewbacca is playing drums, and so on and so forth. So, next, I had to take you on a little bit of an excursion. I promise it'll be worth it, or at least I promise it'll be less than half an hour in length. Uh, this is an excursion into poetry. So I saw this on a blog somewhere. It was pretty much the only thing I liked on that blog, but it said, code is like poetry. Some is beautiful, the rest of it isn't very good. All right. And here is uh, William Shakespeare, um, widely known poet. So it is poetry. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day that art more lovely and more temperate? La Lilia. You get the idea. Here is Biggie Smalls, as another poet. Uh, here is one of his uh, poems, or a fragment thereof. My forte causes Caucasians to say, he sounds demented, come we'd sent it. I have to tell you, it sounds better when he says it. <laughs> you, you probably knew that, but I'm just saying. Now, these guys, obviously very different. Um, obviously people have all kinds of conversations about like, oh, you know, what does it mean, the change in language, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Um, what I do want to tell you about, which I think is kind of interesting, is that there's this whole range of scholarship around uh, the English poetic tradition, and there's this phenomenon of iambic pentameter, which allows you to understand uh, Shakespeare. So the concept of an iamb 
is almost exactly what it sounds like. It's an onomatopoeia, which means it's a word that represents itself through sound, right? Uh, an iambic rhythm follows like I am, I am, I am, which is to say da 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 da, right? It, it alternates a weak beat with a strong beat. So in this example, shall I compare thee to a sum or a day, and so on. That changes a little bit here. Um, this is my attempt to portray the emphasis alternation in uh, this, you know, my forte causes Caucasian to say, you know, it doesn't really quite cut it in terms of portraying the uh, emphasis alternation pattern. Uh, there's also this very well-established, very formulaic and regular pattern of a sonnet, which is the rhyme scheme is very regular. You go A, B, A, B. So shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more love her, love me, and bleh, love thee. I don't know what that's about. Thou art more lovely and more temporary. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaf hell too short a date. Right? So it's A, B, A, B. Whereas here again, you have, you know, te rhymes with k's and se, ka and ka, and then demented, weed scented. So what I decided to do was set it in a monospace font because it actually makes it easier to see what's going on here, right? Suddenly, it's really clear to see that you have this, this, uh, this rhyme scheme here, this rhyme scheme here, and this rhyme scheme, this like triplet scheme down here. Okay, this will become relevant to code in the weirdest way. <laughs> no, I, I'm not gonna go that far. Now obviously the next thing to talk about is Akira. Okay? Now if you're wondering what the link is between hip hop and Akira, you might be thinking, oh, he wants to talk about Kanye West doing a, a video based on Akira. But no, actually what I want to talk to you about is another like mid late 90s album from the East Coast uh, rap scene, That's Them by the Artifacts, which also included an Akira reference. And I'm real happy for Kanye, and I'm gonna let him finish, but this album <laughs> contains the best hip hop Akira reference of all time. Of all time! All right, I just had to. Uh, it also contains this lyric, primetime teams rewind to can't find mine, they all left behind because my rhymes like guidelines. So the idea here is he's saying that his rhyme scheme is so unformulaic that people, even the best in the field, cannot keep up with it. And it's easy to see what he's doing here if you use the monospace approach, right? So you've got, okay, if you have red-green color deficiency, which is a very common form of mild color blindness, you might not be able to see this, but these here are light green and these are bright yellow. And what's going on is the I'm, I'm, I'm are all in green, whereas the I'm, I'm, I'm are all in yellow. And then you got this down here, where he mixes it up a bit, and it's neither I'm nor I'm, it's I'd. And then you got this up here, which I put in purple. Okay, this is a color wheel. So down here is bright green, and up there is purple. And the reason I put these two in opposite colors is because this is the opposite of a rhyme scheme. Normally what you do when you're rhyming things is you vary consonants and you hold vowels constant. But what he did here, oh, wait. Well, I guess he did it there too. What he did here is he, God damn it. <laughs> what he did here, see that's why I don't like the lasers. All right, what he did here is he held consonants constant and, uh, no, he held, yeah, consonants constant and varied vowels. So that's not a rhyme scheme, it's the opposite of rhyming. It's an inverse. Uh, and it's an unusual inversion. I have a friend who is like an uh, English professor, and he probably knows some obscure term for that in poetics. But that is not alliteration. Consonants. Okay, it might be constants, but I don't think you have English professors in, in here. <laughs> The point is, it's kind of unusual, but if you notice, uh, using green like that is overkill because it has this opposite relationship with time. It doesn't actually have an opposite relationship with prime. 
It doesn't really have any relationship with Prime. So there's a little bit of a flaw there. And it's also, this is Python. Um, what I'm showing you right now is not Python, right? You can see that these things are different. Over here is Python, over here is a rap album. Different things, right? You with me? Okay. All right. So we don't actually need to rely solely on indentation. We can throw in some punctuation. And so what I did here is the prime time section is yellow, the time team section is blue, and this section, which is uh, in both, gets yellow plus blue, which is green. Okay? But we can take the color out, and we can even take out the indentation, and now we use punctuation to convey this unusual structure. Who in here knows what Lisp looks like? Okay, that's, that's interesting. So some of you are like, uh huh, he did have a point? And the rest of you have no idea. Here is some sibilant Lisp code done in a Pythonic manner, which is to say that all the structural information is encoded with indentation alone. This is not what sibilant Lisp actually looks like. This, uh, well, this is sibilant Lisp from three. This is what sibilant Lisp actually looks like, right? The syntax coloring comes back in, and there's all these parentheses. Now, if we want, the parentheses allow us to communicate structure in the same way that the parentheses and mustache brackets did just moments ago in that wrap. So we can collapse it like this. Now, when people first encounter Lisp, the parentheses often freak them out. But it's really easy to get past that lickety split as long as you realize that their only purpose is to convey structure. So, there we go. Uh, the structure approaches, or you know, ideally is, a tree. And specifically, the abstract syntax tree. Um, so, a little bit about what the abstract syntax tree is. Here is some Ruby. Um, this is actually an old spec from the original version of Tally, uh, doing repetition detection. Uh, def foo, uh, well, it doesn't really matter. What you see is some very, very simple Ruby, right? So in order, uh, if, if you run Ruby parser, or what was called at the time, I think, um, parse tree, you get this. This is very Lisp-like. If you just imagine these square brackets, were all parentheses. This is what it would look like to code Ruby in Lisp. You say, I'm defining a, a function. It's called foo. It has a block scope. It has no args. And it contains a string, something unique. So basically, in order to process Ruby and make sense of it, you need to turn it into this Lisp-like structure. That's the abstract syntax tree. What you can do when hacking with Lisp is basically work with the abstract syntax tree directly, whereas most form of programming means you are using a text-based user interface to the abstract syntax tree called a programming language. Um, this is Tally because that code was from Tally. See, I'm using the iPad right now, and it doesn't have presenter notes, so I have to kind of guess what my slides are in there for which is why I wasn't able to explain the camel earlier. <laughs> I, you know, usually I rely on those notes quite heavily. Um, but yeah, anyway, it comes from the first version of Tally, which could do repetition detection and very mild similarity detection. And when I say very mild, I mean extremely mild. It basically, it was like on the verge of making a CPU catch fire. Uh, anyway, that was in Ruby, uh, which I like to hack at LARB. Uh, this is the LARB shout-out. Okay, so this is a little mnemonic device to help you realize that the LARB uh, URL is rb.la, right? See how it works? It's like that. Uh, and also this LA Ruby, where you can also hear about these things, uh, types of events. So this is an example of the fanaticism that Lisp inspires. Uh, someone earlier mentioned the Y Combinator, I think maybe Brian. This is the Y Combinator in actual Lambda calculus format, which is identical to Lisp format with the exception of the symbols being different. Like you can actually 
write a lambda on your arm if you are sufficiently motivated, whereas typing one prior to the advent of Unicode was quite difficult. This is this is a possum. <laughs> Looking surprised. So yes, the abstract syntax tree is nifty. It's awesome because I'm basically doing PowerPoint karaoke with my own presentation. <laughs> Sibilant dance. Here we have it. It's really cool. Uh, this is the website. It's sibilantjs.info. And one of the neat things about it is that on the left side, it shows you sibilant code. And on the right side, it shows you how that is uh, compiled into JavaScript. And if you change the code on the left, it'll show up on the right. And you can page through this thing and see a very complete uh, syntax introduction to Lisp as implemented in Sibylla. And it, it's a pretty good Lisp for those of you who know your Lisps, if you like the scheme type of Lisp. So the syntax, this is the extremely brief version of the syntax. So here's how you would do 1.2, uh, sorry, 1 plus 2 in like nearly every language there is. Here's how you do it in a Lisp. You do plus 1, 2. Now, that looks a bit weird, but if you do this, 1 plus 2 plus 3, you again do plus 1, 2, 3. And basically, the more numbers you add, the more cumbersome the traditional syntax becomes, and the more elegant the Lisp syntax becomes. And the reason for that is Lisp is heavily optimized for Lisps. In fact, it stands for, uh, it's an acronym or whatever, for Lisp Processing. Pretty much everything is either a list or an atom. So for example, here we have a list. List. <laughs> here we have atoms. Okay, so basically the, the parentheses, the whole thing is a list and everything in it is an atom. Now, uh, I like to think of that in a much more simplified version. Nouns and <coughs> verbs, okay? Uh, here we have nouns, here we have a verb, and I know that there's more sophisticated terminology, more precise terminology that Lispers use to differentiate between the different types of verbs and the different types of nouns, but honestly, this is pretty much everything you need to know to understand Lisp. It's either a noun or a verb, and the verbs come first. This is, um, okay, so on the subject of not sticking to the old terminology, this is a sort of revisionist approach to language name, right? Uh, PHP, personal homepage, is replaced with laser, looking awesome, scripting everything rules. Perl is replaced with knife, I like that. Knowledge non-stop in fucking expressions, right? Lisp is replaced with bicep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Python is pretty cool as it is, okay. And Demon Lord is just an idea if you need a name for a new language. <laughs> that's, that's an idea to think about. Uh, this, I think this is from toothpasteforddinner.com, I'm not sure. Right. Now, if you are a classicist um, or a purist and you want to find out from the source, this is one of the best books on Scheme ever. It's been in print from like 1952 onwards. <laughs> Which is impressive, because I don't think they actually discovered Lisp until 1959. But anyway, <laughs> I could just have my numbers messed up. So, Sibylline JS is really great, and let me just page ahead. Um, okay, I don't remember what the slide is for. So, Sibylline JS is really great. Okay, so this is actually the same code that I showed you in one of the very first slides to create a Hello World server using Node.js, because this compiles to Node.js. Um, first you do def var HTTP, require HTTP, then you do a create server on that HTTP, but you chain the results of that with this listen down here, which listens on port 8124 on uh, this IP address, and you can see you again set up an anonymous function, which takes a request and response as arguments, writes the head and content type text plane, and writes hello world. So it's pretty straightforward, and it's right there. So normally when you're doing keynote on a Mac, you get to see what slide is coming next. 
Anyway, so here's something I created. Um, I was, uh, this is called missingrubyconf.gilesb.com. Uh, and I created this because I wasn't at RubyConf and everybody was tweeting about RubyConf. And they're like, RubyConf, RubyConf, RubyConf. And I was like, ugh. Well, this makes an easy little app, and I wanted to learn uh, Sybil and Lisp, right? Do something a little more interesting than Hello World. So this just listens on like search.twitter and filters for this particular word. And here it is, this is the whole app. Again, it's on GitHub, um, and you know, please take a look, check it out. It's surprisingly easy to follow. Um, again, it's a little too, you know, I mean, I, I can't get into it now, right? Um, I think I got more slides. I've got, I've got 174 minus 145 slides to go. Um, <laughs> I'm sure some of you can figure that out faster than me. Uh, basically, it does the same thing as uh, any of these Node.js things I showed you, um, but it does it in this very elegant way. Now, I did a talk on Node.js and Sibilant Lisp at LA Ruby a few months ago, and someone, uh, actually a few people, brought up the very valid question of, why are you telling us this? What usefulness <laughs> does this have? Is, is there any good reason to use this aside from the fact that you enjoy Lisp? And I thought that was the silliest question I ever heard, but out, because, no, Lisp, use Lisp. Um, <laughs> I, I was in fact, yes, yeah, I was in fact thoroughly brainwashed by the same guy, oh, okay, I gotta go faster. Um, so here's something kind of cool, which uh, I just saw, I got a few minutes left. Um, this is Lisp actually in the source code, okay? Uh, and this is, I'm doing a script source equals JavaScript sibling info dot Lisp, right? So this is a tag that says pull in this Lisp file. So you can do this stuff client side too if you want. And here's how he did it. This is not actually me, this is the sibling JS site. This is actually uh, Sibilant compiled to JavaScript. This is inject and map and all these various things compiled to JavaScript. And that is trivial. You can just take it from this site. It's not a big deal. Um, okay, this is the book that uh, brainwashed me the most in favor of Lisp. This is by Paul Graham, same influential person who sent uh, Michael on his fascinating wild goose chase. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear he does that for a lot of people. This book dwells quite a bit on the awesomeness of macros, and this is actually an answer for when this can be useful. Okay, so you remember this guy who was like, oh my god, I can't deal with the fact that a programming language is only useful for particular types of problem spaces, <laughs> right? That guy, he raises this problem, if error, throw error, if error, throw error, if error, throw error, right? This is a prime candidate for macros. So macros are basically, I am going to need a particular pattern of code written, so I write a macro which processes my code, excuse me for that explosion noise, processes my code to create other code, so I can write a shorter version of the code, even though I know that the end result will be longer code. So an example of a macro is the chain macro, this is what we use to chain the listen onto HTTP create server. And if you go on GitHub, you can read it. And it's, it's like 10 lines, or maybe that's eight. I don't know, it's just short, right? So two nights ago, I think, something like that, I decided to see if I could create an air chain macro. And I spent 30 minutes on it, and it worked. So first thing I did, just to make sure that the chain thing was working and I was using it correctly, is I did chain this, chain that. This is the stuff from his example. Right, of look how awesome it is to be able to chain stuff. Right, so that's in my Lisp file. I run sibilant experiment.lisp on the command line. The part that I had as a comment is printed out as a JavaScript comment, and the part that I said chain, it chains. So this is an air chain macro. And basically, and it's going to be, it's, you do a def macro up here saying that you're making a macro. Uh, basically, this part here is the money shot. Function error data if error throw error, right? This is basically saying, and unfortunately it's a bit redundant because I put it down here too. This is basically saying every time you process uh, one of these calls, interpolate this little if error throw error thing, right? 
And here I am running it, a uh, sibling experiment at Lisp, it does all the comments. And then the indentation is terrible, the, vi the variable name is not very good, but what you have here is main menu, main window, menu file, function error data, if error, throw error. Data open menu, function error data, if error, throw error. And you can see by looking up at the top that this is what he was complaining about not being able to do. So I did that in 30 minutes. It was the first macro I'd ever written in my life. People tend to make a big deal out of Lisp being incredibly obscure and magical. It's not. It's responsible levels of programmer power. If you plan on doing your job like a responsible person, you know, who, who does their job, then you should be working with power tools. Anyway, this guy does not actually agree with that. Check this out. I don't feel like JavaScript is desperately mass missing macros. Okay? The consensus seems to be that threads are evil. I agree. Source transformation is evil. I agree. And blah, 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 blah. So what I just did in his book is evil. Right? Am I evil? Yes. Apparently I am. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone here is surprised by that. But, <laughs> but I found it to be a shocking revelation. Uh, my, my illusions were dashed. Um, so there's this notion of evil and magical and... Oh yeah. Here's an evil, magical flying camel. Right? It's incredibly terrifying. It's a monster of magical proportions from beyond the, the zone of doom as long as you ignore this crane. <laughs> but if you just look at the crane, it's not magic, it's just real simple. People tend to overreact to macros. <laughs> it says, oh fuck, the acid is kicking in. Jesus Christ, the walls are melting. This is what, how people tend to react when they show them macros. They're like saying, hey, your language would be cool with macros. They're like, macros! No, this is pretty straightforward, actually. Anyway. All you want to, all, all, all that involves is having the ability to work with the tree directly when you might want to. So, I am Giles Boquette. Um, I, I, Giles Go Boy on Twitter. And if you want to know about my new finangly venture thing, which is still very much experiment status, overnight refactor.gilesb.com. Um, thank you.